Good morning, YouTube. Warbles on a lot here with the conclusion to the round table discussion. It will compel the likes of Facebook and Google to give Australian security agencies access to encrypted messages from terrorists and other criminals. But he's acknowledged it won't be easy to convince the tech companies, especially those that aren't based in this country. The legislation will require them to provide assistance to the police to enable them to have uh, access to the information pursuant to a warrant. There is a culture, particularly in the United States, a very libertarian culture, which is quite anti-government uh, in the tech sector. The reality is, however, these uh, encrypted messaging applications are being used, obviously, by all of us, but they're also being used by people who seek to do us harm. Rebecca, you're a small government person, though. It's your, your preference. Um, should the tech companies agree, though? Well, I think it's very interesting. Uh, this legislation, uh, legislation like this was introduced in the UK late last year, made law uh, in November of last year. There's legislation, I believe, like this also in China. And I think if we think of those two examples, that highlights the real issue here. I, I, I think um, uh, that... Uh, from my perspective anyway, a uh, government like the UK, which is clearly trying to target terrorists, but we know is enormously hampered by the number of suspects and the, the, the cost involved of simply monitoring them. Uh, one can, I suspect that they will, simply won't have time to be looking at anything other than uh, things that are related to that. On the other hand, in China, I think there's a lot of fear from companies that it will be used uh, for industrial espionage, and certainly there's a lot of evidence that's been marshaled to suggest that the Chinese state has engaged in that in the past. So I think on the one hand, what's important with legislation like this are appropriate checks and balances, but also looking at in the context of where it operates and where the state is intrusive, doesn't allow freedom of speech, doesn't allow democratic process. Um, I think it's very frightening where those things operate. I think it's uh, probably acceptable. Mm. Clive, not just on this issue of terrorism, but I remember about 10 years ago that uh, you were very concerned about uh, uh, child exploitation material uh, being on the internet. Uh, you were part of, uh, of a push to have some sort of, well, frankly, pretty sensible reforms there. Is this liberty, this objection to cyber security that, that Malcolm Turnbull talks about, is this libertarianism gone mad? It's fascinating you should uh, remember that, Andrew, because the media that we came back to me when we argued that um, uh, use and child access to extreme and violent pornography on the internet was uh, having a demonstrable, demonstrable uh, a serious effect on kids, and the evidence for that has only grown since. And we said that ISP should be required to filter this stuff out. We're not talking about pornography in general necessarily, but extreme and violent uh, pornography. And, you know, all hell was rained down on us, uh, particularly from the, uh, the, uh, the libertarians in the, in the tech sector who um, accused us of all sorts of things. You know, we even received one email which sticks in my mind which we got from the day to put out our reports. How dare you take away my pornography, one man insisted. Well, we're talking uh, now about terrorism. Well, but also, uh, and that's the Prime Minister talked about child abuse material as well, mm. which uh, would uh, come under the ambit of this uh, proposed legislation. And, I, you know, I think, I think Malcolm Turnbull's basically got it right on this. There are the practicalities questions, but the tech, tech sector always says this, you know. Yes, there are practical difficulties. Yes, people will find ways around it. But, you know, the, the nature of the internet is we have to keep uh, following the crooks, you know, and catching up and surpassing them. That's just how, how it works. But I think Rebecca has zero idea on probably the biggest issue. It's a, it's a question of how much we trust our government. You know, if I lived in China, I'd be very nervous indeed. Uh, how nervous are we that the Australian government will misuse it? Well, I think we need measures to try to reassure us that that won't happen. You know, it's like uh, we have an independent um, inspector of uh, intelligence services. Perhaps we need an independent inspector of this legislation as well to reassure the Australian public that it's being used only for the purposes for which it's designed. 
Look, let's finish uh, on Donald Trump. Now, this is the former Prime Minister John Howard. He was speaking on Thursday night at the US Study Centre in Sydney. He suggests that we should hold our judgment on the US president. I think uh, we would be wise to accept that the brush deal making locker room style may not be the whole man. There's a lot uh, about his character we are yet to learn. A better than brusque or locker room style about Donald Trump. Um, is there more to him than that? Well, look, I think um, that Donald Trump has had some notable successes, particularly in the foreign policy arena. And uh, I think his ambassador to the UN, Nikki Haley, is an absolute star. Um, and uh, she's been a wonderful advocate for a much more sensible and robust policy towards the UN. Uh, and so I, I think Howard is quite right uh, for all of those people who were very nervous. Uh, again, uh, I also think that Trump's policy in relation to energy in the United States, uh, in, insisting on much greater uh, efficiency and uh, and indeed insisting on uh, a, state, uh, a line in the G20 communique about greater efficiency in the use and exploitation of fossil fuels, I think is exactly the right approach to take. And it's, uh, it's good to have someone who will stand up to this sort of uh, fuzzy um, uh, consensus in at groups like the G20, which in fact are uh, building coal-fired power plants all over the world. <laughs> I, did, I didn't quite want to return to coal-fired uh -huh, power. Sorry. Uh, but, but uh, Clive, um, is there more to Donald Trump's character than the robust locker room style that, that John Howard referred to? No, I don't think there is. I think that's the whole point about Donald Trump. Um, what we see is what we get. Uh, that's why he can't stop tweeting. That's why he can't stop breaking out of the boundaries because there, there's no plan. There's no Donald Trump has no hinterland. There, there is no death, and it's not. And that's because of who he is. He came out. He's come out of the kind of celebrity age. He, he molded himself, created himself with uh, uh, with the pure superficiality of the celebrity age. So I, I think uh, John Howard is just wrong. But, say that there is a deeper man there that will emerge and will come to reassess him. But <coughs> what, we, what we see is the whole man, and that's why we're scared, because if there were some hinterland, if there were some debt, if there were some plan, we could anticipate that. Well, we could anticipate. Uh, but of course, with Donald Trump, you can't anticipate. You don't know what's going to happen the next day. And in a volatile uh, world with a lot of scary people around, uh, that in itself is frightening. I've just got to stick to his Twitter feed, I think. Look, it's been terrific to have you both. Clive Hamilton, Professor of Public Ethics at the Centre for Applied Philosophy and Public Ethics. He's also the Vice Chancellor's Chair in Public Ethics at Charles Sturt University. And Rebecca Weiss, a research associate at the Centre for Independent Studies. Thank you so much for being with us. Okay. Well. Yeah, I agree with the bloke who said that Johnny Howard is completely wrong when he thinks that there's any hidden depth to uh, Tronald Dump. I think it's interesting that a lot of people were looking forward to Tronald Dump becoming the Prissy Dunce because they thought that his expertise in business was going to give him an advantage in running the nation. And a lot of other people, me among them, figured that if he ever got to be president, and I predicted he would a year and a half before he got there. And I predicted that because I knew that he would appeal to at least half the people in America and they'd probably go and vote for him, and they did. Um, but the fact is that being in business doesn't prepare anybody to understand the business of government. And, and they're two totally separate things. Um, and he's gone into this whole thing, a self-serving, self-seeking, self-promoting, busyness man and even now that his son has admitted that he was approached by a lawyer purporting to, to represent the Russian government, purporting to have electorally damaging dirt on Hillary Clinton, he still thinks that it was okay for him to take the meeting and hear them out. He just doesn't understand what the word quizzling means because they didn't get educated in anything historical unless... It was to do with making money. Um, 
Yeah, I, I, I seriously think that Tronal Dump is the Gaia Principle's response to industrial fossil fuel humanity. And uh, I put up a video concerning carbon capture and storage this week. Is it thermodynamically impossible? And, uh, you know, like this, there's, there's 5.7 horsepower for worth of British thermal units, you know, 14,500 British thermal units, 2,540 BTU per hour is one horsepower hour. So yeah, you have 5.7 horsepower of energy in a lump of coal, a pound of coal. I guessed assessed, made a stab at estimating the um, the efficiency of a power station, a coal-fired steam turbine power station. I figured it'd be 40% would be as good as they could get, turning that energy in the coal into electricity. And I thought they might be getting about two and a half horsepower out of the 5.7. Macropodus Macropode commented on my video and said I was all wrong. Um, he said the IPCC has a report out that suggests that it will only soak up 15% of the electrical output of a coal-fired power station to capture all of its blue gases and then separate out the carbon dioxide and then turn it into a liquid. And then he figured they were going to have a high-pressure steel pipeline running from the power station to the disused mine shaft in some stable geological formation, whereas I figured, no, you can't do that. It's too expensive to build a pipeline to each different dead mine. You're going to have to have refrigerated tankers. And you can't use fuel oil in the tankers. You're going to have to have electric refrigerated tankers because it's all supposed to come out of the energy in the coal that you're burning. He reckons that, no, 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 the IPCC says that they, at the moment, their power station can turn 36.3% of the energy in the coal into electricity. So I overestimated their efficiency there. They reckon that if they do full carbon capture and storage, it'll only drop their efficiency down to 23%, 23.4 or something. Um, so they reckon they're only going to lose 15%. I reckon there's not enough energy in that pound of coal. You know, like they 5.7 horsepower in the coal, they can turn two horsepower into electricity. Okay, but there's half the energy is still in the flue gases. There's more energy in the flue gases going up the chimney than there is in the electricity to feed to the motor, to feed to the fan, to suck it back. And it, yeah, it's, I reckon it's perpetual motion. I reckon that it takes 150% of the energy in the coal to complete the carbon capture and storage thing. That's a complete order of magnitude. What that means is I'm out by a factor of 10. Or, Whoever wrote the report on how to do carbon capture and storage worked for the coal industry and they wrote an overly optimistic report for the IPCC. Or whoever typed up the IPCC report saw the 150%, figured that was got to be wrong, and they put in a decimal point there. And I reckon they've got their decimal point in the wrong place. I don't think there's enough energy in coal to sequester its own emissions underground by mechanical means. But I could be wrong. I could be wrong. <coughs> the point is, it's about 40% cheaper to build a windmill or a solar panel than it is to build a coal-fired power station. And anything that you do to try and ameliorate the coal-fired power station's emissions is going to make it even less productive. It'll be more expensive to make less electricity to put into the grid if you clean up the emissions. And everybody's whinging about the price of power now. So I don't think carbon capture and storage is going to get off the ground ever. Not once, not ever. And isn't it sad that the Greens have made themselves look as stupid, as pathetically incompetent, as one nation and family first? Because, you know, like, they've just lost a senator after nine years, deputy leader of the party, because he had dual citizenship. He was a Kiwi, secretly in disguise. I think the Greens, if they're not careful, they're going to go the same way as the Democrats. Latte drinking yuppies who want to pretend to be trendy and environmentally conscious, but they actually want to depend on a coal-fired power station.
and drive to work in a petrol burning car. Anyway, there we go down on the upload limit. Warbles on a lot to YouTube. Fun work, isn't it? Ciao.